On the morning of the Ice Bowl, the extreme cold caused hardships before the game even started. To begin with, the weather was a complete surprise. I mean, the, the night before, we all went to bed in Green Bay, Wisconsin, thinking it might be 25 degrees above zero the next day. That was the weather report. I got up early and went out to cook my pregame meal. My wife called from the bedroom and she said, Dave, I just heard on the radio, it's 20 below zero outside. And I said, oh, baby, it can't be. It, it might be 20 above zero, but not 20 below. And she said, no, it's 20 below. And I turned the radio on and the guy said, it's 20 below zero and getting colder. And we had a house with a garage that year. The night before, I had taken the car and I backed it up to the step and loaded the car with all of our worldly possessions in it except for the bedding we were sleeping on. And after the game, we were going to get in the car and drive to New Jersey, win or lose. So everything was in the car, but I didn't put it in the garage. Well, I hit the key and it wouldn't start. Just would not start. So I called the a garage and the guy said, you're 116th on my list to get started. He said, well, do the best we can. We still didn't have a way to get to the game. And I saw a guy pulling in the next door neighbor's house. It was a young fellow who was coming to see his girlfriend. And uh, he didn't have a jumper cable, and I didn't have a jumper cable. And I asked him, I said, I'll tell you what, if you'll take my wife and I to the stadium, I'll give you two tickets to the game. I called the garage and told them I was going to leave my keys in the car. They said they would start my car, drive it to the stadium, park it, and lock the keys in the car. Only in Green Bay, Wisconsin, but I feel at ease to do that. I mean, everything we owned was in that car. When we got to the stadium, there was some talk about postponing the game. And so we didn't know if we were going to play or not. It's like summertime, Jim. Yeah? Packer weather. <laughs> Green Bay weather. Oh, boy. This might be the coldest one. Oh, yeah, it's definitely a record today. You think so? Certainly. Yeah, I think it's great. You like it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Some fans fortified themselves with liquid antifreeze to stave off the brutal weather conditions. You couldn't help but look up at the stands when you came out of the tunnel on that day, and the fans were wearing ski masks. And you couldn't see many faces. All you could see is the steam coming out of the mouths of the people. And you got onto the field, and the cowboys were wearing full face masks, and they were steaming. It was pretty eerie looking. This, uh, their skin being covered by this material and just their eyes showing, their mouth, whatever. You know, that was a desperate, you know, kind of a thing to try to stop their faces from getting frostbite. It's cold. You're not going to fool anybody by not wearing gloves and trying to be a tough guy. You're going to look like a fool. I'm going to wear gloves. I'm going to wear long handles. I'm going to wear everything. So what I tried to do, and I think most of us, was Okay, it's gonna be cold, it's gonna be nasty, it's gonna be tough. Forget about that. Now let's worry about the ball game. Let's worry about who we're playing, what we have to do, and what we have to do to win the ball game. In the first half, the field was actually uh, thought out. We'd installed a, like a toaster grid about 12 inches under the field, and so it was soft at the beginning. At first, the soft turf seemed to favor the Packers, who built a 14 to nothing lead on two Bart Starr touchdown passes to Boyd Dowler. The heat was on the Cowboys in more ways than one. Both teams employed portable heaters and makeshift shelters to protect themselves from the cold. But Mother Nature maintained the upper hand all afternoon. I don't think you can prepare for weather like that. I don't think it gave us much of an advantage, if any. Uh, certainly some of their players suffered from the cold, and I certainly think we suffered from the cold. I know Nitschke had frostbite, all of his fingers blistered, uh, had like about the size of a dime, a blister and a peel across the fingers, the toes. I had lung congestion. I sustained a real hard kick to my left uh, tricep uh, early on in the game, and my left arm would felt really numb. But you know what? So did my right arm feel really numb. So did my body feel really numb. It wasn't until after the game and I was in the shower that I totally warmed up, and that is when my left arm swelled up to the size of a leg. I had a serious hematoma in that arm, but it was as if I had an ice pack on that arm. 
that didn't swell. Once you got heated up, you know, as you know, your body temperature goes up and your heart rate goes up and you've got a lot of adrenaline, you know, that, that helped a lot during the ice bowl. I would have not liked to have not been playing. You know, it was much better to have been playing. The cold intensified every hit. The Cowboys' relentless pursuit of Bart Starr paid off late in the second quarter. Number 71, Willie Towns, sacked Starr and caused a fumble. Number 66, George Andre, scooped up the loose ball and scored a touchdown. The Packers made another costly mistake with the first half drawing to a close. Willie Wood fumbled a punt and the Cowboys recovered. The turnover led to three more Dallas points. Danny Villanueva kicked a field goal and halftime arrived with Green Bay clinging to a four point lead. In the third quarter, the game turned into a defensive struggle. Bart Starr, guard Jerry Kramer, and tackle Forrest Gregg discussed blocking schemes. No, no, no it, won't, it won't be even blocking. It'll be odd, won't it? Yeah, probably be odd blocking. Okay. Yeah, both can block it on. He can cut you off. You go down easy. But for most of the second half, the Packers were stymied by the doomsday defense. Time was running short for the Packers, who fell behind 17 to 14 and found it difficult to erase the deficit. And if when Don Chandler missed a field goal, he goes, ooh, you know. Maybe it's not to be. You know, we've always done things we had to do when we had to do them. And we needed that field goal. And we didn't get it. And we'd always been a little lucky. And it wasn't there. And so we had had several series without any gain of yardage. And so you had to think about that a little bit. And I certainly had a little, little sinking feeling that maybe this was not to be. With 4.50 remaining to play, the Packers' offense finally snapped to life and began one of the most dramatic drives in NFL history. If I were to be honest with you right now, I did not think the offense was going to march down the field and score a touchdown. I did not think that they could do it against the Dallas Cowboys that particular day at that time. I remember going onto the field with the offense and having the defense or the punt team coming off and Ray Nitschke screaming, don't let me down, don't let me down. I didn't need to hear that because I wasn't about to try to let anybody down and certainly not Ray Nitschke. When I came in that huddle, uh, I looked at the guys and Bart looked at the guys. And I thought Bart might say something or somebody might say a word or two about the situation. But he looked in the eyes of the guys around me and knew that everyone knew what we had to do. They knew where we were, they knew what the situation was, and they were ready to go. I knew that at the moment we gathered on the field, we had to score. And I kind of knew that we would score. At least I felt that, because we always had. And from the moment we got in that huddle, I just knew we were gonna prevail. There was calmness, there was just a tremendous aura of professionalism, and no fear, and uh, it was just that we had the time to do it, get the job done. We hadn't done a darn thing all the second half, but I really thought we were going to get it done. Running backs Donnie Anderson, number 44, and Chuck Mercine, number 30, with the featured performers on the drive. Bart Starr's play calling and pinpoint passing accuracy propelled the Packers methodically down the field.
brilliance of Bart Starr and the calls that he made. Bart called all of his own plays and the execution of Dowler and Racine and Anderson and everybody on the field was just absolutely sensational. So if, if I ever had to tell anybody what the Green Bay Packers of my era were all about, I'd say go back and watch that drive in the Ice Bowl. When Chuck Mercine made that great run of his and dove out of bounds on the 11th, to me that was a key play of the game because if he didn't go out of bounds, we had to waste the time out. Chuck Mercine had a great heart, he had a great desire, a great burn, and he really wanted to play well, and he had not had an opportunity to be part of a championship team, and so it was a great thrill for him and a great thing to be a part of the championship game and be a part of a championship team. And he integrated himself very well into that team. He was one of the guys. And uh, I think because we accepted him as one of the guys and he felt like one of the guys, he performed like one of the guys. Overall, I'm humbled by the whole thing. I'm humbled that people still send me things every week for me to sign. Last night I signed some stuff. I get them every week and it's 40 years later. Donnie Anderson found treacherous footing near the goal line. From inside the five, he carried three straight times and gained just two yards. It came down to third and goal from the one yard line. There were just 16 ticks left. Vince Lombardi had used all of his timeouts. Lombardi decided to roll the dice on one play for the win. This caused some Packers to avert their eyes. I know Willie Wood and a couple other guys said he couldn't even watch. Willie Davis was standing on the sidelines and he didn't even watch the play. He was so nervous about it, he turned around and looked up in the crowd. A lot of guys couldn't look. It was hard for me to look because you, you're completely helpless. It's out of your hands. You have complete faith in your offense, but it's all them. Nothing you can do about it. Lombardi's gamble worked. Bart Starr's sneak capped a legendary drive gave Green Bay the victory and secured a record third straight NFL title. My main sense of uh, emotion after that score was, whew, got it done. It was relief. It wasn't euphoria. It wasn't joy. It was, whew, boy. There was a tremendous burden on me and on everyone else on the line. And just to see Bart fall into the end zone with the ball, was one of the greatest feelings of relief I've ever had. That was Lombardi football. That's what made Vince Lombardi so great. Going for the score, to win the game, and not kicking the field goal, and going for the tie. We celebrated seriously after the ice bowl. <laughs> we went over to Fuzzy's place, and uh, he had a failure of his heating system. So we celebrated in a room that was about 35 degrees. And so we had to have a lot of antifreeze to uh, keep our parts moving. And so we had a wonderful time. And, and, it, and it was really like a, a Super Bowl celebration for us. I woke up that morning going, have I been dreaming that it happened? Is this a daydream again? This is this some of my musings about whether we played or how I played or, or did we really play the game? And then I think I moved a little bit and felt the soreness in my legs and my arms and knee, head and everything and said, oh yeah, we played the game. And we won the game. Yeah, we did.